We've got your slides. Can we um, so download these slides from this program? No. Okay. So, so you want me to put the order on, right? Yep, we're recording. Great. Okay, Shu, anytime you're ready. Okay, great. Thank you so much for the invitation, Linda. Uh, oh, I really appreciate yeah, I really appreciate this opportunity to be part of this uh, special event today. Um, so basically, I would like to uh, let you know that the principle of my lab is to learn from patients in order to understand the immune control mechanism of HIV infection. And my entire work in the past 20 years is only possible because people living with HIV have been willing to participate in uh, research studies. So I would really like um, first use this opportunity to say thank you to all of you for your generous support of our work. And a special thanks to all the study participants like Laureen, uh, who have uh, believed in researchers and have graciously donated blood and tissue to our research and make our goal of learning from patients possible. So um, today I'm going to show you what we have recently learned from a very rare group of uh, HIV infected individuals, the so-called HIV ED controllers. Um, so it would be very helpful to get feedback from our community and to understand your perspectives on the data I will be presenting. And please feel free to interrupt me at any time during my presentation. And um, just let me know if I'm using two technical uh, languages here. Um, so I'm going to start by uh, introducing the concept of HIV ED controllers and the functional cure, which most of you probably um, are very familiar with. So the first diagram here shows the regular disease progression that occurs in HIV infected individuals who are untreated. And this is usually associated with gradual increase of vibemia and progressive decline of CD4 cell count. However, in ED controllers, we will see a very um, fundamentally different uh, picture than what we uh, just saw. Um, so there's natural control of HIV replication without any treatment. And uh, what we know today is that this can be maintained for an uh, extremely long period of time. Uh, so we actually have patients have been maintaining this uh, ED control status of HIV viremia for decades. So this is still one of the most uh, perplexing and at the same time fascinating problems that we are dealing with. Um, and my research is trying to explain what's the reason for this type of difference. In addition, I would like to emphasize that I do firmly believe that many of these ED controllers have achieved functional cure of HIV and what we are learning from them could be highly informative for um, developing HIV cure and the eradication strategies that we can later on apply to the general population of people uh, living with HIV. So today I'm going to show you the data we generated in search of replication competent virus uh, in HIV ED controllers. And this could help us to understand what a functional cure of HIV uh, could look like. <clears throat> so as you know that HIV is a retrovirus, which means that um, the, the virus carries uh, RNA as its genetic material, and the viral RNA will be copied into DNA um, after they enter the, um, the, uh, enter the infected cells. And the reason that HIV can persist in the human body for lifelong is because HIV is able to integrate its um, uh, these DNA into the human genetic, gen, uh, genetic DNA, gen, uh, genomic DNA, and then become part of the human genome. So we call these integrated HIV DNA as the proviruses. And if these proviruses are perfectly intact, they can then become like, behave like a regular human gene to generate viral RNA and proteins, and then give rise to many new replication competent uh, viruses one opportunity comes. And these proviruses can also be carried on to all the daughter cells from the same infected cell and could persist um, for lifelong. However, the, this integration process is not always uh, very successful. Actually, the majority of the proviruses in an infected in, uh, individual are defective, which means 
they are part of the human genome, but they don't do much anymore because they have a genetic defects, which makes them incapable of producing new viruses. So basically, these uh, defective proviruses are like the fossils um, in the human genome, basically indicating the past history of HIV infection uh, of these cells. So in order to distinguish the two uh, types of proviruses, we have designed uh, this assay. We call it um, near full-length single template HIV provirus sequencing technique. So essentially, after extracting DNA from the blood or tissue um, cells, uh, we diluted the, um, the uh, DNA into single HIV uh, genome level, and then we perform um, nested PCR to amplify almost the entire uh, viral genomes, and then we send them out for deep sequencing, which will allow us to uh, sequence out the whole 9,000 VP um, for our genomes uh, in, in any given uh, sample. And we then use the bioinformatics tool um, to uh, look at these um, viral sequences. And then this uh, technique will allow us to distinguish the proviruses, which we call them genome intact HIV proviruses. Those are the ones that actually can build new viruses. And there are, at the same time, a lot of uh, alternative viral sequences that are defective and would not be able to produce any new uh, viruses anymore. So this is a snapshot of um, how this looks like, uh, the, of the results of one of these experiments. So basically, we were able to obtain over 130 uh, proviral sequences from an HME-infected individual uh, treated with ART. And what you can see here, the vast majority of these sequences is heavily truncated and with all different defectiveness. And only a very small uh, proportion of um, the proviruses are intact here. Um, so this is very important for us to um, uh, distinguish. In the past, when we analyzing or measuring the level of uh, HIV proviruses in a given sample, we're normally only looking at a very short uh, fragment of HIV genomes using either quantitative PCR or QPC, uh, DDPCR, digital uh, droplet PCR. Only this proviral sequencing technology will allow us to map out what really matters to us and what should be the target of a cure effort. Only those have intact proviral uh, genomes, uh, really what we are looking for. So um, using this technology, we then focus on um, the comparison of uh, HIV-ED controllers with ART-treated patients and see what the proviral landscape looks like in these ED controllers who basically have already achieved functional cure of HIV. So for this purpose, we recruited 64 ED controllers in our study cohort and 41 ART-treated patients um, in the reference cohort so from this table, you can see the two cohorts are relatively similar in different parameters. Um, basically, many of these, uh, the, in, in these two cohorts both have a median uh, infection history about 17 years, and then both of them have um, a recorded du duration of um, undetectable viremia for nine years. The only difference is the ED control cohort do not receive treatment, while the ART treated patient cohort obviously um, receive long-term ART treatment. But despite no treatment in these ED controllers, um, our ED controller patients were able to maintain um, significantly higher CD4 cell count to a very healthy level compared to um, ART treated patients. So these patients are really doing very well, well over a long period of time without any uh, antiretroviral treatment. So so you this, could, you uh, us, could you give us your actual definition of uh, elite controllers? Uh, our definition of elite controller in this study is patients with undetectable arrhythmia for at least one year and um, with, uh, with all the um, recorded viral load, we only allow one to two blobs, uh, blips at a maximum with less than 400 copy of viral load during a blip. But most of our patients, as you can see, have been uh, uh, having undetectable arrhythmia for average nine years up to 24 years. 
and uh, there's uh, barely any viral blip. So they are doing very well. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. So using the uh, near um, um single template proviral sequencing technology, we have looked at a total of 37,073 um, proviral genomes among 105 uh, study participant in a two study cohort obviously depends on the size or the, the level of the um, proviruses in the circulation in each of the study participant. We analyze as few as 160,000 cells for some of them, and then we have to, for some of them, uh, we have to analyze uh, over 1.5 uh, billion cells in order to get a, a better picture of the proviral landscape uh, in their uh, circulation. So this is the first um, summary of the data. If you look at the total HIV uh, proviruses, that including all the intact as well as all sort of defective viruses, uh, we, what you can see here, the two study cohort, um, ED controller have about 24 less total proviral uh, reservoir size compared to the ART treated patient. And what you can see also in our ED controllers, every single patient have proviruses, uh, in their uh, circulation. So that's really indicating all of them have been infected by HIV. And with this data set, as uh, similar to what the technology I have introduced in the prior study, you would not be able to distinguish uh, some of the elite controllers. Even though they have low level of total intact proviruses, you would not be able to distinguish how well they are doing in reality. That's why this technology um, is very powerful in this sense that when we're only looking at the intact proviral uh, reservoir size, so only those with um, no defectiveness in the uh, viral genome, then you realize that um, the overall ED controller um, reservoir size is still about tenfold less compared to ART treated patients. But at the same time, we will also notice that there's a more diverse spectrum of intact HIV proviral reservoir size in e-controllers means some of them have extremely high level of intact proviruses, which is really surprising to us, and to the level that higher than majority, like 39 out of the 41 uh, ART-treated patients. So this is really unbelievable. But at the same time, we're also able to distinguish two of these e-controllers with extremely low level of, or undetectable level of um, intact proviruses. Uh, even though we have actually uh, 14 out of these uh, 64 elite controllers so far, we have not detected any intact proviruses, but some of the uh, elite controllers, we don't have enough cells to look deeper. But for one of them, we do have um, a lot of uh, leukophoresis samples available to us to really look uh, much deeper. So one of the questions we first try to address is how can these elite controllers still maintain spontaneous control of HIV in spite of large intact proviral reservoirs. So for that, we use another recently developed um, technology called MIPSEQ. So basically, um, after uh, limiting dilution, after diluting uh, the HIV template to the single genome level, we did a whole genome amplification, which gave us um, 1,000 to 10,000 fold uh, higher um, DNA material so that we can look at both the proviral sequences at the same time looking there, uh, at the, the exact chromosome location where these proviruses um, hiding themselves for. So here I just gave you one example to look at how uh, some of these CD controllers can have so high um, intact proviral reservoir level while still maintain uh, ED control status. So this is a patient that have the second highest level of intact proviruses in all our ED controller cohort, and this is the higher than majority of the ART treated patient, as um, pointed out before. And this patient has been only diagnosed uh, with HIV um, infection for five years, but we don't know how many years before this patient could have been uh, infected. Uh, we have a two year of uh, record before uh, the sampling with no detectable viremia at all. Um, so this. So every single dot here is one of the intact proviruses we have on the phylogenetic trees. And um, we were able to map six integration sites of these intact proviruses onto the human genome. And what you can see here, 
five out of these six integrin sites are located in the centromeres of five different chromosomes. So what is a centromere? So basically, you see this narrower area that's basically a structure component of the uh, chromosomes. So this is a region, usually it's a median of base pairs away from the host genes that do transcribe. And basically active host genes is var very far away from the centromeres. And um, usually these are considered as the gene desert or the graveyard. So you can imagine the intact proviruses, despite they have no genetic defect, once they in integrate themselves into uh, these centromere regions, they are basically have no access um, to the uh, reactivation activity or possibility for these virus to uh, producing new variants in future. So among the six integrants that only one of them in the geno uh, geno uh, genic uh, region, sorry. Um, so we are still in the process of trying to understand how could this patient still doing so well clinically uh, with this one possible site that the intact provider could have grown out, but could be other regulation that hiding this uh, intact provider very well in vivo uh, in this patient. So with similar technology, we analyzed so far um, from 11 ED controllers, um, 92 integral sites for intact proviruses, and compare that with 100 integral sites uh, for intact proviruses from three long-term ART treated patients. And what you can see here, again, at the cohort level, many of the intact proviruses in ED controllers are located in um, non-genic or pseudogenic region on the chromosomes which means um, they will be in a much deeper latency state, will not uh, be able to reactivate easily. So just quickly summarize um, what I uh, just showed you. So our new technology allow us to analyze the frequency of intact provirus sequences, and we see um, the level of the intact provirus sequences in ED controllers varies very widely. One subgroup of ED controllers have a high number of intact proviruses, and another subgroup of eating have extremely low intact uh, proviral reservoir size, which I'm going to talk about in the next few slides. Um, but our integral set analysis also indicating that the chromosome location of the intact proviral sequences in ED controllers are typically um, are enriched in uh, non-genic centromeric regions. And these uh, chromosome locations are usually suggestive of deep or permanent uh, viral latency. So the deep latency of intact proviruses might play an important role in maintaining the spontaneous drug-free um, control of HIV viremia in, in these ED controllers. So the uh, importance of the study is really highlight the point that not only the quantity, but also the quality of the viral reservoir can be a very important a distinguishing feature for um, future um, HIV um, Sorry, for for functional cure of uh, HIV uh, research. So at the same time, we are also in the process trying to understand whether long-term ART treatment could have helped some of the um, treated patient to ch achieve a functional um, cure profile that we observed in these ED, control uh, ED controllers. So currently, we are in the process of recruiting long-term ART-treated patients, uh, basically patients who have received um, suppressive uh, ART treatment for the past 18, 19, or 20 years. And uh, we would like to analyze their um, uh, proviral landscape to see whether any of them already uh, have a profile that we see in these controllers, which means they could potentially already achieve the functional cure and they may not need ART treatment uh, anymore. So if you know any of the patients who have been treated for long term, I will be happy to um, uh, do using this new technology uh, on the samples um, they would um, donate. Shu, so, before going, can I ask you, could you go back to that slide? So this deep latency uh, difference, mm -hmm. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Is that, in other words, they're just, um, um, I'm, I'm trying to think if that, in other words, that's making me think that it's better to try and keep these, this, this thing latent as opposed to waking it up and trying to kill it. But could you talk a little bit more about this profile and, and this 
latency condition? Yeah. So basically, um, so the current thinking of um, the viral reservoir could be uh, at the beginning of uh, treatment. So many of the virus that that um, integrated into different parts of the human genome, some of them could be easily reactivated. So once these reactivated, either the drug could help to eliminate those or the immune system could have uh, help eliminate many of them. So eventually accumulating over time is the viruses that actually hiding in the area that's more difficult to be reactivated. So we find out in these ED controllers, we don't know how they approach the status, 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 but we could possibly because the strong immune system they have, any of the virus that easily reactivated have been already eliminated. So what is left over in these patients are the uh, virus that's hiding in the area and that doesn't matter for the host anymore. So they are in the area that's we, what we call deep or permanent latency that would never be able to reactivate in vivo anymore. So this is different from the um, what people have believed that try to reactivate the virus and get rid of them for the cure strategy. So sometimes possibly to block and lock these uh, intact proviruses in the position that doesn't hurt the host anymore could be another strategy for uh, HIV cure. But you're saying this is completely different and they're in a permanent latency state, maybe because of their own immune system. Yeah, there could be. <clears throat> so, uh, just a question, why do you believe it's a permanent latency state? Why? I know that it doesn't have the environment to have the triggers to reactivate it, but could it potentially move at some point? Like, why do you think it's permanent? Like, what's the understanding around that? Um, so, so for, basically, once they are integrated into the host genome, they are not going to moving. They're going to move to anywhere anymore. So they're going to be in that location. So if they are in the centromere, they're going to be in the centromere forever, unless the cell died, completely eliminated this. Otherwise, this virus in these cells and all their daughter cells will be in the exactly same location. And secondly, um, is that the reason I didn't say all of them in permanent latency, some could be just deep latency because some of the epigenetic regulation could have changed the latency status later on during the you know, aging process, uh, during different uh, immune activation conditions. Uh, so I can't tell all of them would be either permanent, but overall the data have shown that they are in much deeper latency than we normally see in ART treated patients that a lead controller were able to achieve on their own. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so now I'm going to switch to um, talk about the uh, ED controllers on the other spectrum of this analysis. So you all know probably very well that there are two HIV uh, cases that have been uh, reported. There might be additional ones like the Dieseldorf patient, but the two of them that we all know very well are the Berlin patients and <coughs> London patients. And both of them achieve this cure status through very um, kind of complicated medical procedures and um, uh, quite, quite toxic um, kind of um, uh, procedures as well. And um, the Berlin patient has been really characterized very um, deeply and um, he has been uh, able to uh, control or maintain undetectable viremia for 12 or 13 years by now. But if you look at our ED controller cohort, we have um, many of them have more than 12 years of undetectable viremia not achieved uh, on their own without any treatment or, or interventions. So one of the questions we ask is, uh, could it be possible that uh, HIV have already been cured through natural immunity at least in some of these uh, ED controllers. So one of this um, case, we call these patients as exceptional ED controllers. So one of this case is um, this one patient had been diagnosed with HIV infection in 2007 and have never been treated. So of the 12 year uh, record we have um, so far on this patient, we have only one marginal uh, detectable viremia in 2010 and the rest is all, uh, are all undetectable. So um, we, we have um, leukopheresis sample from this patient from 2014 and 2018. So we have been uh, trying to um, sequencing uh, all the proviruses in this patient. Uh, we have been only getting 
um, kind of sequence with large deletions until we analyze 1.01 billion uh, peripheral blood cells, we finally get one intact uh, proviruses uh, in this patient. And um, as I mentioned, if you have used the prior uh, uh, kind of um, measurement technology, use qPCR to look at proviral uh, reservoir size, uh, you will not be able to distinguish this patient from away from the rest of the uh, ED controllers. And you will still see uh, many counts of the, in, uh, of the proviruses, but actually many of them are, majority of them are defective, only one of them are intact. But the other possibility is because of so low frequency, we were not able to um, kind of get the integrity side of this intact proviruses. But one possibility is that if this intact virus is also integrated into the area that I just talked about with deep latency, this patient probably in his lifetime will never see um, var a kind of ongoing viral replication in vivo anymore. And this is the second patient that we referred as the San Francisco patient. So this is patient had been infected with or diagnosed with HIV infection in 1992. Uh, have never been treated. And from the record we have here at the Rigi Institute um, for the past 24 years, uh, we have no detectable viremia uh, from this patient. And um, so we have leukophoresis sample at the Rigi Institute uh, from this patient in 2009. And Dr. Steve Dix at UCSF helped us to obtain additional sample in 2019. And um, again, we have been isolating um, plates after plates uh, trying to uh, sequencing out the proviruses from this patient. And what we have seen, there are four near full lengths, so it's about 9,000 BP long sequences we, have, uh, we were able to obtain, but all four of them are super hypermutated sequences. And we also see 15 of the uh, provirus sequences with large deletions. And interestingly, some of them are identical. So they come from the same uh, infected cells, uh, probably early on in the uh, during the infection. And what we see that there are four of these sequences were uh, captured in 2009 sample, and three of them were captured in 2019 sample. So this is really indicating the cells that harboring this defective proviruses have been persisting in this San Francisco patient for the past at least 10 years. And again, if we have used the prior uh, technology to analyze um, this patient sample, you would detect uh, proviruses, but you would not be able to say these proviruses doesn't matter anymore. They are not intact. They are only defective proviruses. So uh, Steve uh, also sent um, over 1 billion uh, PPMC samples to Dr. Jen and Bob Silicano's lab at Johns Hopkins, and they did um, the QOVA, I say the quantitative var outgrowth assay, uh, over 340 million resting CD4 cells. And we did a similar assay on 41 million uh, total CD4 cells. So none of these assay were able to uh, find uh, replication competent virus. Um, so the estimation here for in this patient, the inducible replication competent virus is less than 2.6 copies per billion compared to what we normally see uh, one copy per million in uh, this resting CD4 cells in most of the ART treated patients. In addition, uh, Bob and Janet group also used their novel IPDA assay um, to um, detect uh, proviruses in 14 million resting CD4 cells. And consistent with the sequencing data, they did not see any intact proviruses, but they did see um, either deleted or hypermutated proviruses um, in the patient. Uh, so overall, um, the total reservoir size in this patient is estimated to be at least a three lock, which is um, a thousand fold lower than uh, what we normally see in ART treated patient. So this is the newest piece of information um, that has not been presented at the IAS meeting in, in July. Um, so we obtained uh, about 4.3 million uh, cells from the rectum and 3.3 um, million cells from EDM from this patient. And we did full length single uh, genome provirus sequencing uh, on these samples, and we did not see any proviruses at all um, on these samples. This is in a much deeper analysis than what have been described in the Berlin patient. So basically, except the Berlin patient, who have really been uh, studied quite extensively, 
these two patients have the lowest level of intact HIV uh, sequences that ever recorded in a HIV patient. Um, so although the logic of scientific discovery would never allow us to confirm that the San Francisco patient has achieved a sterilizing cure of HIV infection uh, through natural immune mediated mechanism, uh, it is important to note that um, we have failed to disprove this possibility after analyzing massive amount of cells with a range of complementary, highly sensitive um, detection techniques. So basically, we uh, believe that the San Francisco patient might have approached a sterilizing cure of HIV through natural immunity. You, uh, excuse uh, me, fine. could you please remind me what are CD45 positive cells again? Yeah, the CD45 45 positive cells are mainly the mononucleoside uh, uh, cells. So they are the main cells that contain CD4 cells, the macrophages, everything. So that could be the major uh, possibility for viral reservoirs. The CD45 negative cells could be all different other cells in the gut. So that's rele okay, less relevant. You. Yeah. So finally, I would like to thank uh, my team, Xiaodong and, and uh, Charlie, um, and also our collaborating team uh, uh, in Dr. Leach, the Felt Lab, Chen Yang and Matthias. Um, they have worked really hard in the past two years to generate this large amount of uh, data. And I would also like to thank Dr. Bruce Walker for leading the international controller cohort that allow us to um, get access to these precious samples. And obviously, as I mentioned at the beginning of my uh, presentation, I really appreciated all the support from the study participant. Any of these studies would not be possible without their uh, active participation in research. Uh, I would also like to thank our collaborator, um, Dr. Steve Deek's group and Janet and Bob Sidicano's group uh, for their um, collaboration and discussion. And finally, I'd uh, like to thank all the funding agent. Thank you so much for um, um, listening to this and then I would love to get your feedback. Wow, that's really amazing. Um, I have so many questions, I'm not sure where to start. Um, so, what would you need to actually say this was a sterilizing cure besides more time? Yeah, I mean, as I mentioned, I think the same as the Berlin uh, patient, there's no way for anyone to say this is a cure, absolutely a sterilizing cure. There's no way to confirm it, but the only way to do is to, dis to disapprove that hypothesis by analyzing more and more and more. That's we, what we have been trying to do. Um, but so far, we were not able to um, kind of disprove this possibility. Right. That's the only way to say it. What sort of immune factors are you finding that might contribute to this? I mean, what sort of host what? factors are, are, are you finding that, that might, you know, comprehensively run through all these different patients? Sorry, I, I, I missed the first part of the sentence. What? Okay. In other words, are you seeing different host factors? What host factors might you be seeing that are similar in all the elite controllers that you've looked at? Um, I, yeah, I mean, I believe ED controller is a very heterogeneous population. Every single patient could have teach us something different and how they are able to control uh, viremia to this extent on their own um, by their community uh, immunity. So I don't think there's going to be a general um, consensus, but there could be subgroup of ED controller and each of the subgroup of ED controller have a different um, immune control mechanism operational in vivo in these patients. So for example, you probably all know very well, HRA B27, B57 have been highly associated with ED control status of HIV. However, if you look at all the cohort study in, have been published in the past, it's really 20, 30% of ED controller have B27, B57. The other 70, 80% of ED control do not need B27, B57 to be ED controller. So there must be other mechanisms that are doing that as well. So at the same time, I also think we haven't really analyzed very comprehensively, unbiasedly, of the immune responses in ED controllers. So that's how this project actually initiated when I try to get NH funding to use system biology or system immunology approach to unbiasedly profile uh, 
both viral and um, immune responses in ED controllers, large number of ED controllers, in order to say, you know, this subgroup of ED controller could be because they have this uh, characteristic, that's why they control, and the other group of ED controller could be because they have another mechanism. And some of them could be applicable to the general population, and some of them, some of them probably just unique to these patients would never be able to applicable to others, such as B27, B57, you will never be able to have that for uh, ART treated patient, right? If they don't have, if they don't have the protective Leo. Anybody else questions? Uh, yes, you you Did mentioned I your the concept. You mentioned the concept of deep latency. You're probably aware of the work of Susanna Hello? Valente at Scripps with the, with the TAT inhibitor. Hello, can you hear me? Hello. Yes, can you hear me? Maybe you can speak up a little bit more, Siggy. Hello? Uh, I tried to. Can you hear me, Shu? Shu, can you hear me? Linda. Well, I think we fine. lost her. Let's see if she's still. Elle, does it look like she's still on? Like yes. Yeah, and it, it, it even seems like she's speaking. So maybe are you on mute? Did you did you mute your phone, Ju? No, she didn't. Sometimes when you mute your phone, it, it doesn't look like it. Now. No, I know, but sometimes when you if you're on the phone and you mute your phone, It doesn't show on here that it's been muted. Yeah, a funny little X there, I mean, an arrow next to her name mm -hmm. that I haven't seen before. I think that, that means that she's sharing. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> perhaps if she actually stops sharing, it might help some of the other glitches. Mm -hmm. Let me... Sorry, um, oh, there this is Shu. The internet didn't work. Great. Now, Siggy, you want to try again? Yes. Um, you, are you uh, you're probably aware of the work of Susana Valente at the Scripps Institute with the TAT inhibitors? And she calls her concept also deep latency or, the, or block and lock. Could you speculate mm -hmm. on that? Might that have something in common with what you are observing? Yeah. Yeah. I, I recently actually saw her um, uh, in Boston. Um, she has seen my data as well. Um, I, we, we, we don't know whether this is the same mechanism that what she sees versus what we see in these ED controllers, but the concept is very similar. We do see a block and lock phenomena in ED controllers, which really mean large number of intact proviruses as long as they are locked in, in the area and blocked from transcription, they can stay peacefully there, we don't need to touch it. We don't need to find a kind of a, the shock and kill strategy to try to induce them but, anymore. But you didn't check for, so, for TAT activity or something like that, did you? Um, we didn't specifically analyze that. I did talk to her, that's something that we can look at together. But from what we have seen so far from our roughly, and because we have the whole virus sequence with us, right? From what we have seen so far, we don't see a clear uh, from the sequence, a TAT deficiency at all. Um, we don't know whether there's other regulations that could be possible. Okay, thank you. So that was what I was trying to get at before. So it might seem that a better strategy would be to do what we can to keep this, this, vir you know, this virus latent as opposed to try and wake it up and kill it. I mean, it looks like it's possible to do that at least with some people on their own. So maybe we should try that instead of trying to wake it up and kill it. I mean, it could that yeah. be what you're telling us or what we might be, you know, I, what we might be predictive of? Yeah, I think, I think that's why, I mean, one of the main uh, kind of, that's what I mentioned before, one of the main uh, project now for us is to, is to really have the full view of what's going on in these long-term ART-treated patients. What kind of virus is still left in their genomes? Do we need to do shock and kill or should we let them be where they are with this lock and block strategy and, and just 
stop treatment to see what's going on with them. But I think before that, we need to have a deeper understanding of the molecular basis of this and yep. know exactly where they are integrated in the human genome and really analyze the microenvironment where they are to see whether they can still be reactivated that easily anymore. Well, if it ain't replicating, don't fix it. <laughs> well, I, I, have a, I have a question. So in theory, what you're saying mm -hmm. is that people who have been on ART and with an undetectable viral load for a long period of time, you can now mm -hmm. do sequencing on them that can help them uh, know if the amount mm -hmm. of intact virus is deep sequenced mm -hmm. and therefore not likely to uh, reactivate. So someone in, in essence yeah. might have a bit of a, a measure of how close they are to being able to be taken off ARTs if we recognise that under a certain threshold um, they can now come off ARTs uh, safely. But the other question that I have for you, so just some comments on, on that understanding whether that's correct or not. Um, is that what, what 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 are you learning that actually matches well, it's with a the conference call. With, it, it's, what what are you, what are you learning that matches with the Visconti trial with the patients that have been on ART and treated early and whose treatment uh, when they when they're off treatment after two years or so they're then able to maintain an undetectable viral load naturally so is there some comparison being made between the immune systems of those that are early, early treated and the immune systems of of um the elite control as a comparison between the two and the and i think back to linda's point around the host factors uh, that will allow for potentially uh you know uh, a functional cure for people yeah. Uh, the first part of what you said is uh, correct. That's what our hypothesis, working hypothesis at the moment, and we would like to um, confirm it with a, a more uh, kind of study participants. And I'm happy um, to be in terms of second, <laughs> sorry, what did you yeah. say? I'm, I'm just being cheeky. I'm saying I'm happy to be one of the people that you do a study on because I've had undetectable for you know, over 22 years. So I'm happy to be one of those oh, people. Perfect. I was yeah. waiting for that. So, so, I'd like to be the first one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Linda, we can yeah. hear you. I'm teasing him. Oh, okay. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah, that, that's, that's what I'm, uh, I'm like, will be super excited to, to be able to look into that. Um, so the, that's, that's exactly what the working hypothesis at the moment. Uh, unfortunately, we didn't really do all the sequencing no, so for that, the Visconti yeah. cohort and some, yeah, on the post-treatment uh, controllers. But on the other hand, we also have to distinguish a little bit of elite controller, how elite the, the status versus the post-treatment controller, how well they are controlling. So some of the post-treatment controller is not as um, strictly controlling their viremia as what we normally see in our ED controller cohort. So we have to be careful where we draw the line. And obviously more data collected um, on different sort of uh, clinical outcomes could help us to narrow that down a little bit more. Yeah. But, there, but there could actually be similarities or host factor similarities between elite controllers and post-treatment controllers that will allow us to, you know, laser in on what we need to do yeah maybe absolutely yeah absolutely i i do believe i mean we don't have the this uh, get a hand of uh, uh, kind of get a hold of the this cohort samples but we do have a couple patients that was by all different uh, reasons stop treatment and some of them maintain kind of control uh, for over a <clears> period <throat> of time so far and we did some of the viral integral side analysis of our pro-viral sequencing analysis on them. <coughs> and we do see some of the features similar to what we see in the controllers. So definitely this um, profile of where the, <coughs> how many intact proviruses, where the intact proviruses sit in the host genome could predict how long uh, these people could maintain um, control after treatment interruption. Jeff Taylor's in on this too, it seems. Jeff, did you have a question? No, no, I didn't. I'm sorry. Shu, another question from me. 
Uh, you're obviously sequencing only <coughs> virus from PBMC, so from blood, right? Uh, what about viruses in reservoirs like lymph nodes, gut tissue, or even the brain? That's a good question. Yeah. So <clears throat> we obviously for the San Francisco patient, we already got a, a gut biopsy sample, and we are in the process to uh, collect lymph node and gut biopsy on some of the ED controllers that we already have the peripheral blood data. <clears throat> At the same time, we also, for the, you know, the long-term ART-treated patient, we also hope that we were able to maintain not, uh, uh, obtain not only the peripheral blood samples, but also lymph node and the gut biopsy sample, if that's um, possible. Anybody else? This is amazing, Shu. It's really amazing work. So, I, I no, you guys are amazing. Um, Amazing audience as well. The very good questions make so us Zhu, think more. <laughs> so, so Zhu, what's your what's your speculation? I mean, because you've only done a, um, these tests in, in blood, and you're getting samples in the other, uh, you know, the lymph nodes and and, and other uh, sites. Um, what's your mm -hmm. speculation of why? Because we know that uh, HIV uh, or intact provirus is potentially in those sites. <clears throat> Uh, is, what's your speculation around why have those sites not activated in these elite controllers? Like, why, why not? Like, is it because in those sites, is your speculation potentially that in those sites, they are also in a similar um, inactive sequence state within those sites? Like, what's your speculation as to why it hasn't come up from those other sites as well? Uh the, you mean the, the site that we see in ED controllers that don't come up? Yeah. They don't easily be activated? Yeah, like, you know, um, you, you've done the sequencing in blood and not necessarily in mm -hmm. the lymph nodes and other sites, but intact, mm -hmm. uh, intact provirus, when they're placed in a particular sequence in the genome, if I understand this correctly, mm -hmm. um, don't activate, they're in deep lock. So is your speculation yeah. that the intact provirus in lymph nodes are also in deep lock, uh, potentially in tissue and brain are in deep lock. Like what's your speculation mm -hmm. why, why it hasn't become active from those other sites? Yeah, so I believe this is a co-evolution co between the host responses and also the other intact virus that has been in the site that it re easily reactivated had been eliminated over time. So whatever currently left are the one in the deep latency. But that doesn't mean these patients in the early infection, they don't have that at all. <clears throat> because their immune system could have done such a great job, but never something come out, they eliminate it. And what left is only the ones that are currently in deep latency. So that's kind of the function to, functional cure that we would like to achieve. But we need to find out, uh, so for example, longitudinal sample on these patients would be amazing. But the, usually the problem is ED controller, when you find them, they're already many years of infection, they're already in the perfect ED control status. So you would not be able to trace back to say what could have been there before, what the immune system had been doing in the past to make this possible. Um, but at the same time, we also see even in long-term, in ART treated patient, the early treated patient, you would have a lot of intact proviruses that's still in the lighter latency uh, region, but then over time, those things can just burst and somehow by drug or by the cell death or by innate immune responses or even some of the T cell responses, adaptive immune responses that already um, kind of um, prepared early infection, ready to kill those out. So what later on after 10 years of treatment or 20 years of treatment, what is left? Also the viruses that in deeper latency. So that's why we have this hypothesis we try to think about and if these patients achieve over time that type of profile that's similar to what we see in big controllers, can we stop treatment on them? So so how it is, sounds how... like it might make sense to have a sort of a sequential, um, a sequential uh, treatment where you, you started with a kick and kill to activate all the easily reactivated viruses and then maybe have a, a, a block and lock for the ones that are left. Absolutely, that's exactly right. So 
that's exactly right. But before we do that, that's why I mean, it, there's a lot of questions to be answered. But unfortunately, these essays are super labor intensive, super expensive. So that's why um, we were thinking about, you know, let's see whether the long term treated patients have already reached up to 20 years, already reached something that is really hopeful. Then we think about how do we shorten that 20 year period. Exactly what you said by shock and kill at the beginning, get rid of any, as much as possible what is could be easily reactivated, and then don't touch the others that in deep latency anyway. So, so if I understand you right, what you're saying is that over a long period of time, the active virus has already become active and the immune system has fought it off and you are left over mm. time with more and more intact virus but in deep latency locked state. And so what we're trying to work out is what are the potential host factors that allow that to happen faster and potentially what's the threshold of deep latency for people for, to, you know, to measure potentially to say that they've achieved this already and they didn't know that they have. Is that the scenario? Yeah, no. Yeah, what you said exactly. You're you're much better better than I do. You you said very well. Very good. Great. So well maybe anybody more any more questions real quickly? We still have Lorena on the phone to tell us about her experiences in the trial and you know maybe what we can learn from her as activists. So um anybody <laughs> any more questions for Dr. View before we leave? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you so much. This was really marvelous. We'd love for you to stay to listen to what Maureen had to say about the study. Maureen, are you still with can, us? Can I stay or? Oh, yes. Is that okay? You're, you're absolutely welcome. I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. So, so Maureen, the, the, the lady of the hour or the year or the maybe. <laughs> lady, um, first of all, congratulations. This is wonderful for those of us who have known you for, God, 15, well, 20 years. It's just wonderful. And I'll, let me just say that it, how wonderful this is for the first patient in your sort of situation to be a woman. So, yay, maybe that'll mean uh, more studies in women. So well, one us, can hope. Um, the challenges, what was good, what was bad, and what we can do to help you. Well, first of all, what I want to say is now I understand why my video glitched because when I saw Dr. Yu's final slide, I just broke out into tears. Um, it's, it's extraordinary to see your own data presented in such a fabulous way, Dr. Yu. It, it's really remarkable to listen to you speak about really honing in on my cells and then those recent gut, gut uh, tissue samples, the biopsies that we sent you in September. And uh, I want to thank you for your dedication to trying to figure this out. And so I'm over my sobbing, um, and I can only hope and pray that uh, in your continued um, dedication that we figure out the mystery of how on earth I have dumped uh, the virus into the DNA junkyard. Um, this is this is really important. These calls, by the way, and through the years, I've attended hundreds of them. And as you can see, Dr. Yu, uh, we have a really um, well-educated audience for these presentations. But it's always good to not assume that everybody has HIV 5.0 knowledge, right? Um, one of the one of the things I wanted to share with the group and thanks for staying over is um, that in my experience over the last 15 years with uh, being a volunteer for 13 different studies, um, the researchers have been extremely generous with their time in sharing their observations, not only of my immune system, but uh, long-term non-progressors and HIV controllers as a general um, population. Uh, in fact, in one case, a uh, principal investigator has always set aside time on the day of my clinic visit um, to speak to me privately. And over a period of 13 years, these private consultations have become norm for he and I. Of course, um, this is kind of an exception to the norm 
as it would, I think, be unreasonable to expect the researchers and particularly the PIs to come um, visit with every single participant in their study. But I, I think it's well within the volunteer's right to request this type of consultation, of course. Um, not to mention that it, it sets up a building of a relationship, particularly over time, which I've had the fortune to do with these individuals who are so dedicated to our cause and are trying to figure out these mysteries. Um, for example, um, the coordinating research staff is, is really amazing at UCSF. They're super efficient. They're Hello. excellent. In Hello? That's me saying, go Becky, she's on the call. Somebody. Yes, yeah, so they're, they're just so excellent, you know, in streamlining the travel plans and lodging if necessary, timely follow up, uh, particularly with sharing my lab results. And I really feel that this team serves as a model of how a research coordinating staff should work with their study volunteers as a team, right? by sharing copies perhaps of the informed consent documents in advance um, or coordinating a direct connection to the researcher or even a medical professional associated with the procedure if the need arises. So I just want to, you know, put a shout out out there for the SCOPE uh, research coordinating staff. Um, they, they've been so wonderful and helpful to me through the years, and I've known them since 2007. So, Linda, you asked me to kind of put out there a best advice to um, individuals who might be considering volunteering for a study. And my, my best advice would be to um, advocate for themselves, right? Be familiar, for example, with your medical history um, your blood pressure, your medications, any allergies that you may have, um, your health in general, you know? Um, and I'll give an example. Uh, when I just went in for that colonoscopy uh, at UCSF in September, I know, I went in knowing that my blood pressure is normally very low, and being aware of this fact led me to request that fentanyl, not be used as part of a combination of drugs for sedation, um, primarily because I knew that fentanyl lowers bl blood pressure. But two, on the other side of it, in no way did I want this drug to be introduced to my system, period. Um, I expressed that to the medical staff, and I also said to them that I would rely on their expertise and training to come up with an alternative, and that's exactly what they did. So to the, to the person who's considering volunteering for a study, just ask questions if you don't understand a term or a comment or a procedure. Self-advocacy self is um, just number one on my list of advice, and, and that's really what I can offer today, right? been a marvelous experience, um, Dr. Yu. Uh, I hope in the future that um, when I come to Boston that we'll be able to meet and uh, I'll continue to try and help with the exception of a limp node, by the way. I've decided not to do that. Um, hopefully um, you can extend your, your um, observations with the cells and the gut tissue that I've provided. At my age, I think it's a little risky to give you a limp node from my groin. And uh, I, I just wanted to put that out there. <laughs> but um, good luck with the work, and I appreciate the updates. And if anybody has any questions for me, I know we're over time, I'd be happy to respond. Let me ask you, you said such wonderful, wonderfully nice things. What could uh, they have done better? What would have made it a little bit easier for you? Anything you can think of? Well, the only, the only recent experience that I had that, that was problematic, and um, I think that it was kind of excitement that I might come back, is an itinerary for a week, for a week visit to Boston. That was last fall. And um, 
to apheresis to do a leukapheresis and a colon colonoscopy within the same week and also have a speaking engagement within five days was a bit ambitious. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's indeed why I did not go to Boston. It was overwhelming. And um, my immune system, although robust, uh, at my age, it does take me a little bit of time to recoup from an apheresis. I get very tired. And then, of course, the, the, the related preparation to colonoscopies, if none of you have ever um, had one, um, is kind of debilitating. Plus, you get really hungry. <laughs> but... Um, Everyone was in their enthusiasm, kind of disregarding the wear and tear of flying across the country um, and then flying back home across the country and kind of shoving all these activities in, in a five-day period. And that's really the reason why in um, the shares that I did this spring and this fall for the billions of cells and the gut biopsies through the colonoscopy. It was so wonderful for Dr. Walker and Dr. Deeks to arrange a share. I'm only two hours away from San Francisco. I feel incredibly comfortable with uh, Rebecca Ho and all of her colleagues. And um, it was only a two hour trip for me. And so the wear and tear on a um, uh, middle-aged gal, it just made, it was just more realistic. So, but I really, Linda, can't talk about any negatives because in 15 years, um, I think that I've been treated very well. And um, I think that building relationships with everyone, the coordinating staff, the researchers is really important. Uh, plus, they're just really cool people. Great. Any questions for Laureen? Amazing, Laureen. No, just a shout out to say hi, Laureen. It's Becky. Thanks for all the lovely things you've said, and thanks for all your participation over the years. We, well, we can't thank you enough. You, you are remarkable there, and um, I'm just so grateful to have you on the call. Um, when my uh, when my email, I was trying to give you kind of a um, an alert that I intended to talk about your staff, you and your staff. That's when our little um, email time expired <laughs> this morning. But it's wonderful of you to join. I really appreciate it, and I'll see you in a couple of weeks in San Francisco. Yes, looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Uh, so, so Lorraine, just a, a question on um, media and how this is handled. Like, have you been like declared as like the the first woman with HIV uh, who has cleared the virus naturally is now cured? Has that actually has it been stated in those sort of terms, or or uh, uh, maybe a different question? What is your preferred way in which it should be stated from your perspective? I really appreciate that you'd ask me that question. You know. Um, the word cure has so many different connotations and we and the activist network and excuse me for the blowers, my gardening crews out there for this apartment complex, um, they're walking by thankfully. Uh, the word cure is a loaded term and, and those of us in the network, you know, we've, we've gone back and forth on it for, for many years by this time. And um, uh, my thing has always been not to give people false hope, right? Uh, and I have to put it out there that no one is more amazed than I am that uh, my immune system happens to be at this point in time um, a representation of one of the most uh, efficient immune systems known to science. Uh, I knew that there was something different from the beginning, um, but I never in my wildest imaginings ever thought that I'd be having a conversation with uh, Dr. Walker or Dr. Yu or even um, Dr. McGillis at the NIH. There was something radically different about how my immune system works. So, 
So I'm grateful for that, and I try to walk in humility with that. So back to the question, um, the, the term remission, it, you know, typically used in discussions about cancer, um, I think is kind of a misnomer as well, uh, mainly because I've been so asymptomatic from the get-go, you know, for 27 years. Um, I guess the question that we need to ask ourselves is, is even though the, the virus was transmitted to me, right, uh, so-called infected me, um, have I ever really been in a state of disease? I mean, if we're thinking about clinical parameters, you know, I've been entirely asymptomatic for 27 years, never had a viral load blip. I've always had an extraordinarily high CD4 and an almost exactly flat 50% ratio between CD4s and CD8s. And so what am I most comfortable with when people try to describe my case? I'm comfortable with unique. Um, I have had many hours of thought about clearance of the virus. Um, I, I think it's very interesting, these more recent studies from Dr. Yu's lab, uh, that it seems that I've dumped the virus into, I've inactivated it somehow. Um, DNA junkyard, I think was the term. I think that's extraordinary. I think it really calls for a dedicated study of just that. And, and your questions to Dr. Yu today about why that is and how can we translate that. So I don't know. I think it's going to be an ongoing discussion, Sippy. I, I, I do wear that medical tag. I implemented a formal protocol, as you probably saw in Bob Rohr's article, uh, to donate my organs to science uh, at the event of my death. Uh, for them to continue their work, to perhaps get closer to the answer to the question about where the hell did this gal put this virus, right, in her body? Is it in her brain? You know, where is it? So it's an ongoing story. It might always remain a mystery. But this is my hope, whether we say cleared, cured, or remissed, right, that um, I've brought them a step closer to understanding how they can help 40 million people in the, in the world right, that they can get closer to exactly what it is, um, that they can maybe re is flipped on in me, that is flipped off in others. And that's why I continue to donate to these studies, right? And I'll do it until they tell me that they don't need me anymore. So it's a long answer to your question, hon. I think we need to continue to talk about the lexicon, right? But all I can say is I'm humbled, I'm grateful, and I will always do what I can, with the exception of the limp note, <laughs> to get them closer to the answer. Yeah? Thank you, know, you. you know, Maureen, you might want to consider, I don't know if this might work for, for Dr. Sue or whomever. I mean, we try to, uh, we, I think that lymph node biopsies are kind of um, out of favor because of different side effects. And, you know, people are using fine needle aspirates to just get a little, to get a little. Yeah, we've discussed it. It's yeah. still under discussion, you know, currently. We're, we're negotiating, let's put it that way. Okay, that um, so we'll see what happens right but thank you for listening and and thank you uh, so much for scheduling the call and um it's real i'm sorry i couldn't see everybody but again i'm kind of glad that it went down because uh i get all puffy when i cry oh. well i tell you you almost have me crying so that's a really uh, that's the feat <laughs> Thank you so much, Marie, for joining us, and we just wish you all the continued success in the world with this. Um, I mean, I just words can't express how people like me and everybody on the call have been doing this for so many years. This is just such progress, and to have it be somebody that
that we know and are friends with is, makes it all the more um, meaningful and rewarding. So hang in there, girl. I'm just really touched by it, Linda, and, um, you know, hopefully if there's one of me, there's another of me out there, and I'm going to try and help and find them, right? Um, I'll do what I can. So thank you so much, everyone. I know you've got to go. It's late, especially on the East Coast. And um, uh, it's a labor of love, folks. That's what we're here in the world to do, right? Right. Help each other out. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Shu. Everybody who participated, great call, and we were very happy that you were able to join us. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Linda. Bye-bye.